So these design patterns, behavioral design patterns, help us define manners of communications between classes and objects. So as you can see, that's a lot of classes and objects, but don't worry, we'll get through them in no time. So let's get started. Because behavioral design patterns are quite complex, we're gonna need two parts to cover it all. On part one, I'll go over template method, chain of responsibility, command, iterator, mediator, and memento. On part two, I'll go over observer, strategy, state, and visitor. All right, first on our list is template method. So what it does? Well, as you can imagine, it provides a template, a skeleton to allow inheritance with subclasses and extensions in different way, providing um, a method of extending our algorithm without modifying it. Possible examples are parsers, loaders, and persisters. And taking a look at steps that each of those require, we are going to open the file, read from the file, and then close the file, right? These three steps need to be executed no matter what kind of file are we opening. If it has to be an XML, JSON, XAML, or whatever else, right? And we can um, be sure that every single parser that we are going to be using has to implement all of these three steps. So we are doing this to maintain the control of step overriding. So take a look at this diagram. We have template class with four steps and template method. As we can see, template method is going to call all of them in order. And in order to change some of the steps, we basically override the steps that we don't want. And in this example, we will override step one and three and two will be default nothing. Simple, easy, let's get to the next one. All right, the next design pattern is chain of responsibility, also known as chain of command. So this design pattern allows us to separate the actual handler of the request from requesting object. And the good thing about this design pattern is that we don't need to specify what kind of handler is going to take care of this request ahead of time. So we have this strange hierarchy, but what it actually means is we are coming up with some abstract handler. If they can, they will handle your request. If they cannot, they will pass it to the next handler class. How are we using this? So we instantiate concrete handler, and then we use a reference to it to instantiate another. And with that reference, another, 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 another. And in this way, we get a chain of handler classes. So we start with the final class and we send our request to it. If it can handle our request, it will do so. If it cannot, it will pass our request to the next handler in the chain and so on and so forth until the end. And there is another trait to it. We can stop the handling at any moment in the chain. All we have to do is handle the request and not pass it further. This design pattern doesn't promise us that the actual handling will happen. So it's good to remember that, well, actually nothing may happen at all. So what are good examples of usage of chain of command or chain of responsibility? Well, all of the user generated events. So clicks, keyboard strokes, anything of that nature, maybe network packets that are coming in. All we have to do is take such event and send it to our handler. And for example, mouse click contains the position like X and Y, and it's sent to a button and the button handles it. It checks if the position of the click is within its bounds. If it is, it handles an event and it stops it from propagating down further. And that's how chain of command works. All right, next one, command. The command is a bit messy one. It has a lot of classes, a lot of messes happening here. What it actually does? Well, it encapsulates the request in form of an object. So when we use a command, we know who is going to handle the request, which object. We know what the request is, what kind of action do we want. But what we don't know is who is going to invoke the command. It is a common case in UI. Take, for example, copy command. It may come from different 
sources in UI. You may press an icon in toolbar or open an option in menu. But what you also can do is press a keyboard shortcut. All of those can actually execute a copy command, right? But the thing is, but the thing is we don't want to store the code of this command in every single of these items, right? We want to store it somewhere separate. So it's unique, it's not repeated in the code, it's dry, and then we want to use it in like nice and elegant way. So in order to build a command, we need a reference to a receiver. We take that reference and we pass it to a constructor of concrete command. That is stored in an interface to a command and then passed to an invoker, which can be anything. A UI button, a key map of some sort that will invoke commands whenever appropriate keystrokes come in, or maybe a UI menu. And then, whenever this event comes in, invoker calls the assigned command and in turn actually executes the code on the actual receiver. Plain and simple. The only thing is that all of these explanations online are always so messy and tangled and convoluted. No, command is simple. All you have to do is create a container for your action that knows the actual receiver of your action. And you pass that to an invoker. Simple, easy. Next one. Right, so the next design pattern is iterator. So iterator is used for one single thing. Iteration. It's kind of obvious, but at the same time, the principle of iterator isn't that easy. Well, what it has to do is provide unified abstract way of going through elements in the collections that we have. So we can use it on a map, on a list, or perhaps on our own container. For example, a composite that we were using back in the previous video. So what is the iterator about? Well, it consists of two interfaces that get concrete implementations. One interface is a container and the other one is the iterator. So iterator has to provide means of navigation through our collection. Get current, which returns the element at current position. Next element will move the pointer of our collection to the next element in it. Simple. Other method that we could add is, for example, is last that will tell us if this is the last element in this collection, right? And our concrete iterator has to, well, implement all of these methods, right? Now we need a means to actually get an iterator to this collection, right? So we need a container. Container interface promises only one method, get iterator. And whenever we have a concrete collection, concrete type like list or map, they should have some method that will give us the iterator to it. So all that can be used with simple call from the client. Map, get, iterator. Next element, next element, get current. And that will give us third element on whatever type that we are using. It's good to know that we can create our own iterators and provide them to native libraries in the system. For example, it's quite easy to provide such iterators in C++. Look it up, it's really fun. All right, let's look at mediator, also known as intermediary or controller. So oftentimes we have this scenario when we have action-reaction behavior between components. For example, textbox. Textbox on a form that has to notify other components that its state has been changed. For example, it has been clicked or it has new value. So in order to inform all of the possibly interested components, it would have to store a reference to every single component on the form. And whenever we add new component on the form, you would have to update all of the text boxes and all of the other possible components that may be there. So we would have this convoluted network of connections and references to different things that everybody has to know about everybody. Not really a great scenario. So what we are actually doing then? We are coming up with mediator. So mediator is an object that encapsulates relations between two objects to make them independent of each other. So how is mediator actually built? Well, we have this mediator interface 
and it will be used by all of the objects that want to notify everybody in the system. So we are inheriting from the mediator interface and providing a reference to the interested cooperating component. And whenever notifying component changes, all it has to do is know about the mediator. It doesn't have to know about everybody. It only sends this particular notification to a concrete mediator that is responsible for handling this particular type of notification. And our mediator will take a reference to a sender, a message, and it will send it to interested cooperating component. Of course, it has to know about every single interested cooperating component that handles this particular notification, but that's way easier than actually tying everything to everything. <laughs> the next one is Memento. Memento is a way of storing internal details of objects without exposing them to outside world. And it's often used to save current state of the objects. It can help us provide undo capability, undo feature of the system. There are many possible scenarios, but the things that I can think of are we don't want to allow the users of our class to tamper with the internal state of the object, right? Because, well, it's fragile, it may break the system, or it can do stuff that it isn't supposed to. So in order to protect that state, we have to create a memento interface with single method, restore. And we will have to provide a save method to our originator class. So if we want to save, say, bank account status, this is our originator. That will give us a memento object. And in the save method of this concrete originator, we are actually saying, okay, construct a concrete memento and we will pass a state to its constructor. And then we will return this newly created concrete memento to the user, to caretaker class. And caretaker will basically store it on some sort of stack that will provide a history of our state. And whenever we want to use the undo feature, what we basically do is we take one element from the stack, we take our concrete memento, and we call restore method on it. Now, because we also stored a reference to originator, we can easily call set state method on it. We take our stored state, we send it to set state on the originator, and that's basically restoring the original state. Now Memento object is used and it can be deleted. And that is it for this part of behavioral design patterns. I hope that you enjoyed, I hope that you learned something, and if you want to know more, want to see the second part, be sure to subscribe so you won't miss it next week. And in the meantime, be sure to share, like and comment on this video. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!